Good afternoon and good morning to you all and welcome to the online conversation on community perceptions of vaccination in the time of COVID-19. So my name is Sheetal Sharma. I'm a doctor in public health working in Kenya in remote uh, and fragile states. Uh, today I have the pleasure of chairing this session. I'm also a member and a vice chair and the vice chair of the Gavi Civil Society Steering Committee who is hosting this session on behalf of the Gavi CSO constituency in partnership with Action Network, Results, Save the Children and Gavi. Before we get started, I want to run through a few logistics about this event platform. So today we want to hear from you during this conversation. Please share any questions and comments with us by submitting them in the messaging box or the chat box found on the right hand side of your screen at any time during the presentation. We'll be monitoring messages and have set a time, we have set aside time at the end for some of these questions to be asked of the speakers. Today, also I invite you to join the conversation online by using the hashtag vaccines work. Many of the host organizations will be live tweeting points throughout this key event. Let's make it dynamic. This call is being recorded and a summary will be distributed in both English and French for those unable to attend. So thank you everyone for joining us today and thank you all for doing the great work you're doing for our communities, uh, right both where I am in East Africa and globally. Uh, we want to make this a conversation and the format for today's discussion will be full questions and answers. So we have videos uh, up for the speakers as well as slides for most of the event. The main objective of the sessions are to provide an opportunity to frontline health workers, social behavior and communication experts in different settings to share their perspectives and recommendation on how to restore routine immunization, trust in the system and prepare for when a potentially successful COVID-19 vaccine will be made available. We also want to reflect on the 2020 experience in routine immunization and the pandemic's impact. We also want to draw what are the lessons learned, what are the good practices, what are our wishes and hopes for this upcoming year, and what can we call on our global and local leaders, uh, such as parliamentarians, uh, GHI, pharma, the UN development agencies. We also want to talk about innovative solutions for restoring trust in routine immunization service within communities and increase service seeking behaviors. I have pleasure to introduce to you today the following speakers, Dr. Rina Ray, a development and communication specialist from Core Group India. Dr. Joseph Egedivi Sariki, a senior health technical specialist from Save the Children Somalia. Nazish Karim, a provincial master trainer with UNICEF funded project on polio and essential immunization Pakistan. Radharani Mitra, the global creative advisor for BBC Media Action India. And last but not least, Edmund Dudu, the Executive Director of Divine Mother and Child Foundation, uh, Ghana. Uh, over to you, Rina. The point for me here is that language becomes practice. Okay. Practice becomes policy, policy becomes culture. Thank you, uh, Sheetal. Can you hear me? And lastly, I'll end by stating again that we need to uplift. Hello. Frontline and local. I can hear you, Rina. Um, can I ask uh, everyone right else now, in the background to please mute their mic yeah, if they're was... not uh, speaking? Over. Thank you. Hello, Neil, can you share my presentation, please? Hello. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, okay. Uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Diana and Sheetal, uh, for giving me this opportunity to share uh, our experience uh, of uh, immunization in the time of COVID. So I will just share some of, I'll just take you uh, back 
some of our experiences that we had in polio eradication, uh, which has helped us in uh, combating uh, challenges that we, have, we are facing during COVID-19. Um, so uh, can you move on to the next slide? Uh, so uh, core group polio project actually works in uh, two states of India. At the moment, we were earlier in uh, many states, but as the virus uh, was uh, cornered, we had to also uh, work our uh, intensive work in uh, two states at the moment, that is Uttar Pradesh and Haryana. Uh, so we, have, we are working in this social mobilization network, which was formed uh, by UNICEF and core uh, to, to uh, work in high-risk areas where uh, people were not cooperating or they were resistant for polio immunization. So we had to deploy from community mobilizers from the same, same area, same place, uh, based on the epidemiological and operational criteria. So there were certain criteria which were set by WHO and government. So uh, we followed that. So when it comes to implementation, I mean, we know that communication actors were uh, our, our community mobilizers, but mainly our communication were based on two factors, that we had to adapt the BCC uh, foreign eradication program, and we have to overcome uh, resistance uh, for polio vaccination among uh, caregivers. Uh, can we move on to the next one? Uh, so, uh, what happened in polio eradication is community believed that it's a birth control program and different vaccines are used and, uh, and there were so many other, mainly the, these two were, were, were the key one. So, uh, earlier it was very mass uh, um, uh, awareness driven uh, um, communication. So, we had to shift from extensive awareness approach to addressing specific needs of the specific groups. So we had to categorize actually our communication approaches as per the population that we were reaching. In terms of um, building the capacities of our frontline workers, that is community volunteers, we had to change from instructive to negotiation approach. So, 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 so that they can be a friend, they can be mentor, and as well as they can be a coach. How we did that is, um, is giving them the skills to negotiate, giving them the skills to, uh, to communicate effectively. Uh, and that, that could happen only because we had some, we had given them the tools that are simple to use and also which are relevant to the local uh, context, as well as uh, they were comfortable using it during IPC and group meetings. So what we have learned during this entire course is that uh, unless we listen to um, the community, including our community mobilizers, including our community volunteers, as well as vaccination team, we won't be able to reach uh, each and every community in this um, in, a, in a given area. Can we move on to next one, please? So uh, similarly, we had to also understand the social science of each community that we were working on so that none of the communities are left out as well as dropped out. And uh, in the course of this, we had to uh, work on uh, each and every questions, even doubts that were raised by the community. And we were given, on, we were um, equipped, we equipped our uh, mobilizers, our volunteers to answer it rationally with fact and figures. And, and this has really helped us in understanding the social science of each communities and which has given us the result of involvement in a greater uh, moment. Um, as you can see, uh, I mean, this is one of the uh, photograph you, which is very famous now uh, in one of this district where uh, each detail and each question were answered by our uh, um, field level workers. Can we move on to the next one, please? Uh, so in COVID-19, we used all the lessons that we have learned in polio communication to address COVID-related issues. And how we did it is, I'll just take you through. So basically, uh, the problem that, that we, we had encountered in our uh, area is that at the community level, there was definitely fear of getting uh, COVID. And if, they, if we, 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 we promote them to go for testing, they were really very scared of getting it uh, done because they knew that uh, community and neighbors and relatives, if they come positive and it, they may boycott them and which was leading to stigmatization. So this fear actually prevented people from uh, seeking healthcare. 
for other issues as well, as well as for COVID also. So they were hiding cases and people are still hiding cases. A lot of cases are being hidden. At the frontline worker, what happens is government had requested our frontline worker to go house to house, to do house to house survey uh, for message dissemination, as well as for to, to collect the data that if anybody is sick or not. So uh, what has uh, come out is that during that, those interactions uh, with the frontline worker and community, uh, they blamed the frontline worker that you are bringing disease to my home. You are bringing disease to my village. So, um, and consequently they were treated really very badly when they knocked the door. So as a result, some of the health workers were very hesitant to do the survey. They were very hesitant to do house to house visits. So this was the main problem that we encountered. And to, 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 to counter these problems, what we did is, uh, can we move on to the next one? So through our, uh, um, as, as, as we were working, we, had, we are still working in core group polio project in India. Uh, our field staff had identified and mapped a large number of influential people as per the nature, belief, and behavior of each family, especially families who were non-cooperative. So, uh, so we had a, we already had a list of these people who are uh, working in various locations, who are uh, um, very influential in various villages. So uh, we reached out to them, and uh, and uh, and these people came voluntarily and wholeheartedly to support the program. The, so we made uh, community action groups uh, involving these people. And they were from, uh, it's a basically a community-based uh, focused model that works on integrating uh, social, cultural, and educative approaches. Um, basically, we started this community action group to combat fear and stigma initially on uh, uh, related to COVID. And also gradually as we moved on, we included uh, vaccine hesitancy also in their agenda. Uh, they were they were also oriented again and again that what is the importance of vaccination in this COVID period, ensuring that your children are immunized. Um, since uh, for few months uh, the vaccination sites were um, closed and vaccine uh, was not uh, given to the eligible children, um, so uh, they were basically working on uh, combating fear and stigma. So, but looking at the current scenario, we uh, didn't allow them to uh, meet with 10 to 15 people. So particularly in, uh, in, in community action groups, uh, we had asked them to meet with four to five members, keeping the physical distance uh, in mind, as well as always wear the mask. So as you can see, uh, um, mask and, uh, and, and physical distance is maintained in the photographs as well. So, uh, because we were also worried about their health, not only just uh, communities. So our field worker were oriented accordingly so that they can pass on the same information to the community uh, action group members as well. So basically, can we move on to the next one, please? Um, so uh, in addition to this, uh, we also uh, trained our community volunteers who were interacting directly with the influential people as well as community members, especially mothers, through phone, WhatsApp, and uh, IPC meetings means, uh, when we say IPC meetings, it's not very close meeting. So uh, from one uh, house to another house, there is a wall. So we have asked them to talk, uh, keeping two to three uh, meter distance. So our, our community volunteers started doing that after a while, I mean, after four months, but initially they were only talking uh, and passing on the information through phone and WhatsApp. So what basically these people were doing is promoting health seeking behavior for uh, COVID as well as immunization. And if they see any support uh, needed for affected person or family, uh, in availing health services, our volunteers have supported them, which has actually proven to be so helpful. And people have come, they came forward and they, they were taking help of these influential people and community volunteers. So they actually uh, dispensed critical health information in related to um, um, COVID as well as immunization. Um, and stigma related also, uh, we had to orient our uh, influential people that 
what which word not to be said or uh, in what context it should be said so all these little little uh, local words also we had to work it out and uh, let them know that these words please do not use when you are talking in the context of covid with the community i think we were very sensitive in making uh, these informative messages um, that can be passed on by these influential people so uh, we now also, two minutes uh, to go please yeah Deepa. sure so we also help the families and communities to understand what has happened and how to deal with it and we ensure that each uh, our influential people and uh, community um, volunteers are available in person or on the phone 24 hours can we move on to the next one please so um, in terms of immunization sites uh, we are definitely promoting that it's safe and clean immunization session which are sanitized with support of local uh, village leader and ensure that vaccinator is wearing mask and glove vaccinators are using sanitizer after each vaccination and physical distance is maintained uh, some of our influential people have also inaugurated our uh, session sites and this leaflet was developed which was used which very clearly talks about that uh, uh, which one is correct behavior and which one is wrong behavior can we move on to the next one please so in a nutshell we can say that uh, over in uh, our immunization experience for polio eradication that the determinants for restoring trust in immunization is the shared goal and urgency clarity of roles which we very much defined uh, even if a influential person is working at the village level as well as among partners so ownership and pride of involvement operational freedom to innovate we really had to give that freedom to our field worker as well as to 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 organization that are working and complementing roles and responsibilities right from the national level to the uh, village level and shared credit for failures and success we, we might have uh, tried some strategies which we failed but but we we share the credit of failure and success it's not a stand alone failure that an organization or an individual can take and a seamless partnership in polio actually we uh, we we had it and there was no blame game so i would end with this thank you very much for listening to me and um, thank you thank you very much arena i hope i am within the time <laughs> just <laughs> thank you very much uh, you. dr rena that was a very very interesting presentation um i wonder if i can request uh, dr joseph uh, if you're ready uh with your presentation it can go off next thank you very much <clears throat> and it's really a pleasure to be part of this uh, conversation to share the key insights around keeping trust in immunization and uh, very briefly i would be sharing some of our insights from uh, the chronic humanitarian setting of somalia and how we've been able to navigate um, the provision of routine immunization at the peak of covid and issues around that have led to vaccine hesitancy and how we've been dealing with it. Um, just <clears throat> as a way of background, Save the Children have been in operation in Somalia for quite a while, um, over six decades, about 65 years. And we've been operating, providing um, a series of um, both humanitarian and development uh, interventions. And um, very recently, we began to increase our strength our focus on um, routine on strengthening routine immunization and we started um, targeting um, key areas where um, have been <clears throat> newly liberated or very hard to reach and remote areas seeking to accelerate um, immunization activities and that all of that happened before the covid started before the covid 19 um, pandemic and um, covid 19 seemingly had uh, really changed um, the terrain and the way things work. And uh, I will just be highlighting some of the factors that we've noticed over the past couple of months that has really contributed to um, some significant uh, hesitancy in vaccine uptake in, uh, across some of our health uh, facilities. 
here. So the, the first thing we observed in a couple of uh, months into the pandemic was um, a significant economic impact because there was some uh, issues around uh, movement restrictions. People were unable to go about their normal activities. And as you would expect, Somalia, the economic capital for Somalia is really weak for individuals in Somalia. And with that um, impact as well from COVID, it really, really um, tilted uh, the population to the edge. And as such, uh, the most women really do not prioritize immunization at the moment. And as such, they focus more on what they would eat, what they would be able to provide for their families, as opposed to prioritizing uh, taking their children for vaccination sessions. And <clears throat> just also to build on that, we discovered that uh, really accessing these women going for vaccination, accessing um, vaccine services has really been limited, majorly because also that uh, an average Somali household has a very weak uh, system, financial system to make itself, uh, to provide resources for themselves. And as such, to be able to weather the storm of COVID, they really needed to go extra mile. And most, most times in remote communities, accessing health facilities requires travels of, um, of 10, 15 kilometers in some cases. And as such, they really do not want to prioritize that. So that's one key issues, issue that um, had come up as, as part of factors resulting in uh, vaccine hesitancy. Then also there was, there is this um, growing negative perception that we've observed very strongly, growing negative perception that we've observed very strongly. And this majorly is within um, the urban um, communities in Somalia. And really, the, it, it's around some conspiracy theories about how you know, the COVID-19 it's brought in for some wild reasons and some unfounded um, basis. So that on its own has really um, had some impact and people are beginning to rethink about the whole concept of um, vaccination. Why are we giving, taking our children to vaccination? And as such, um, the trust that has been built over the years, you know, the trust in women being confident on taking their children for vaccination to prevent uh, uh, vaccine prevent preventable diseases. Though that trust is being eroded and we really, something urgent needs to be done and it's what we've identified and we are really working on. And uh, Save the Children is part of um, the RCC task force for COVID-19 in Somalia. And we are really, really working together with others stakeholders to, to address that. One other thing we observe very strongly in the southern parts of Somalia, the, the challenge majorly was with supply shortage of vaccines. And how that resulted in vaccine hesitancy was in the initial months into COVID-19 pandemic, women kept taking their children to health facilities, but because of the shortages of vaccines, shortages in availability of vaccines, these women get fed up and really felt since these vaccines are not available, it's not something to be prioritized anymore. And that is what the challenge we started facing upon um, the return back to normal as um, Somalia is journeying back to normal post COVID or still in the COVID phase, but um, as we gradually move towards uh, the end of the COVID-19 pandemic, it's one of the issues we are currently facing because we have um, situations where vaccines have become available, but the women have really had that, um, that, that they are fed up, so to speak, because they've 
accessed health facilities for vaccines and these vaccines were not available. This we've noticed in difficult how to reach um, communities. And like I did mention earlier, some of these women had to travel kilometers to, uh, to get to this facility. Imagine getting to the health facility to be told the vaccine you came for for your child is not available and you have to go back without um, meeting the goal or the purpose of you're going to the health facility. So that we've been trying to address. We are already putting in place measures to begin uh, accelerated uh, immunization outreaches and campaigns. And one other key thing we've also noticed, like I did mention, behavior change is, is a systematic and trust building process that happens over a long period of time. And um, we've discovered that COVID-19 has really, really breached that process because um, we, we have sit various situations where uh, the, the, the women have this perception that with all of the stress that has happened, they don't see vaccination for children as priority anymore. They should focus more on um, how to provide for their family and um, the negative perception going around as well, also contributing to, to that coupled with the supply shortage, you know, all of this has really, really breached that um, trust building process of the behavior change, which we have gradually began to see. And we really need to address that critically. In Somalia, we are making efforts to address that. And it's one of our priority as a country in uh, the coming year 2021 to focus on um, reaching zero dose children and also accelerating outreach services in remote hard to reach areas then also building some trust back you know with the community intensifying um, c4d approaches and uh, activities just to ensure that um, the trust is restored and also as we build to um, the introduction of covax of the covid19 vaccine it's really very critical for us to strengthen the social behavioral change component as well. And that trust in particular because of the conspiracy theories. And, you know, we, we foresee, we anticipate a situation where the, with introduction of the COVAX, there could be a drastic reduction in uptake of um, vaccination because of the penetration of the this unfounded conspiracy theories. And we have, we anticipated that and we've begun to, you know, put in place um, messages and, um, you know, have um, engaged with various stakeholders to find ways of addressing those particular negative messages around uh, the COVID-19 and the introduction of the vaccine. So these are some of the things we've, started doing and we will build in on that as we go into 2021 and we hope that with the introduction of um, COVAX we will seek to ensure that um, the hesitancy that could ensue with uh, COVID-19 is, um, is addressed. One other key thing I needed to um, mention. Joseph, is, uh, two minutes to go. Over. Sure, sure, sure. I'm, I'm wrapping up right now. Yeah, I just wanted to highlight one other key point. In the southern states, in most parts of um, Somalia, one of the things we've um, also anticipated is the fact that we need to really strengthen the um, supply chain systems and uh, the coaching structures across all of Somalia with the introduction of the vaccine because it's really, really important that um, we have that system, the, the coaching system, the supply chain structures are functional and optimal so that upon introduction of the vaccine, there won't really be gaps and um, as such, it won't result in um, vaccine hesitancy, particularly for, you know, uptake of um, the COVID-19 vaccine when it's introduced. So this, um, in summary, are some of the key factors that um, we've experienced in 
in Somalia context being a chronic humanitarian setting, which might be somewhat different from other settings, but um, it's some of the factors we've noticed and we've anticipated some of them and we are putting in place. We've started some measures and we'll build on, on that as we enter into 2021. I would stop at that and take um, questions at the end of uh, the whole session. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Siriki, um, and thank you uh, for those who are just joining us or who are with us already. We've already talked about mistrust in communities and how to better understand social behavior. Um, what are the factors behind that? With the, what are the, who are the key players? Uh, Dr. Siriki has just touched on how um, what factors in communities lead to hesitancy um, beyond the fear of contracting the virus. I want to turn now to uh, Nazish. Um, and while she's putting up her presentation, I want to sort of, Nazish, I want to uh, keep, uh, kick the ball off with asking, given the detrimental impact of COVID-19 uh, on immunization service seeking, what do you feel the role of civil society is in rebuilding trust in immunization as we look to build back better and stronger from COVID? Also, maybe can you touch on to reflect on the role of national authorities and the common issues countries have faced in tackling this crisis, um, issues such as access to health, um, the disparity between urban and rural, is there a synergy among health programs? Um, and what can communication campaigns do to help prevent the spread, uh, especially with issues of shortages of PPE? Um, over to you, Nazish. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Uh, you can see that they're keeping in trust in immunization, community perception. So uh, in, uh, can you go to next slide, please? Uh, here you can see the, the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on immunization services. Uh, you can see the drop down and the dip uh, in, in April 2020, you can see the impact on immunization coverage across the Pakistan. The tip was due to the lockdown, due to the lockdown closure. Can you hear me? Uh, now that I can hear you loud and clear and your, your screen uh, is on, over. Okay, thank you. Uh, the closure of health facilities, uh, API centers, fear of infection, distribution of supply chain, halt in outreach vaccinations. In the first half of year, about 1.3 million children missed their Panta 3 vaccine. Plus, 70% of them are in 40 districts of Pakistan. About 300,000 children could not complete their vaccination from the Penta 1 and Penta 3. More than 700,000 zero dose reported in the country. And out of these, about 30,000 identify in SRHR uses in last campaign. So you can see the, the, uh, the result of uh, COVID-19 COVID, uh, COVID pandemic, and you can see the drop down and the zero, do dose, uh, zero doses case cases in our uh, Pakistan situation. So in the next slide, you can see, uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Yeah, thank you. In February, the first COVID case was confirmed and locked. Lockdown was imposed throughout the country in March, which was a resulted suspension of immunization services. In April, IPC guidelines were developed and health staff was trained. So the suspension, um, so the vaccination services. Hello? Um, you're still on. Uh, we can hear you. Over. Where I missed. You're on your slide of EPI uh, and PIE continued. It's focused on immunization children. Okay, so in April, IPC guidelines were developed and staff was trained uh, that the vaccination services were resumed. The result of opening fixed sites and the supplies were replenishment whenever required. To the catch up with the high number of missed children, extension of outreach activities started in the June were scaled up, scaled up in July. Mob up campaign was conducted in the specific areas, which included like SRHRUCs, program distributed soaps, masks, 
the community, the community through the polio frontline workers. Vitamin A supplements uh, as another SISD intervention that was done in August polio SIS. In September, you can see that the integrated referral services initiated was launched as well to improve RI coverage in the pilot UCs. So you can see that the, uh, in in uh, in September we uh, we intervened the uh, the referral services mechanism in some of the piloting UCs. So in the next slide, next slide please. So here, uh, this is the graph of uh, PI cases countdown um, from 2019 versus 2020. And you, due to the pandemic emergency, no proper zero dose routine children were recorded with high number of CVDP in 2020. So in the graph, you can see that, that the 83 CVDP cases, plus we have the high number of uh, zero, um, zero routine dose as well some of not properly recorded as well due to the campaigns could not take place which was planned as a, in april i already mentioned that in april we have the lockdown situation over here so uh, you can see that the planned activities were not uh, uh, done due to the pandemic and we have now uh, 83 cvdp cases uh, in pakistan uh, in the year of 2020 so what were the uh, next slide please Thank you. Uh, so here, the post post COVID situation impact on immunization. You can see that the services associated with the lockdown and fair COVID in the test in the start resulting in a huge number of zero doses defaulters, women who miss TT and internal care. One of the uh, question which was already mentioned in the chat box that the TBT vaccination is also uh, pregnant women vaccinations was also so, uh, suffered due to this pandemic. I, 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 right now, I don't have the statistic of that uh, woman count, but uh, in Pakistan, TT vaccination and internal care was also suffered due to this uh, situation. Community trust, which was already lacking before the COVID-19 got on more, or more severe below blow down to the COVID as they knew that the government cannot ensure the safe environment in health facilities. Health staff FLWs got test positive uh, for the COVID-19 too. Even right now in this uh, second phase, second wave, we have plenty of our uh, frontline workers. They are uh, COVID positive and uh, they are working from their working from home, and the situation is uh, going uh, worse again. Uh, less availability against the demand of PPEs and practicing SOPs in, uh, is a challenge across to the, to, to the board, uh, board, board, top to bottom. So what, uh, what, uh, we, can, uh, what we can do to restoring our trust uh, in, in for the community and uh, what we can do to restore our trust, uh, to, to restoring the trust of community. Can you, uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So engagement of uh, local influencer is, is essential for the bringing back the trust. Government health department shall be responding to health needs with uh, with the more reboot support and global uh, partners shall be helping more. Here, I just uh, missed one point. Uh, I want to add one more point here that the government should select local EPI technician that would create a greater impact on our coverage community trust. The, that the person, uh, the, that, that that person and they will be accountable for their community as well. Even uh, right today, I, I saw that the uh, we need uh, government government need to hire local API technician because if if we hire the local API technician, that would be create more accountability and community trust more on those persons as well. In third point, the community youth activist champions play effective role in the terms of uh, uh, bridging gaps such as our community youth champions group, um, which was uh, um, uh, plenty of people know that uh, some of our uh, community champions group are working actively in these kind of, in EPI and PEI synergy programs. So uh, the fourth point is community engagement involvement of religious leaders, mosque, parents, teacher committees, leader, uh, political leaders, mother groups, father groups, social media, IEC material, PSA shall be engaged more frequently for awareness, social mobilization in order to rebuild community trust and uh, it will be also play a vital role towards the vaccine acceptance and demand creation. 
uh, Ms. Rania has already mentioned this point uh, for in, in her uh, presentation. So I think this is the most important key point that uh, we also focused on the, during our community engagement uh, plans and during uh, our community engagement uh, involvements. Uh, another point, uh, micro plans, uh, last but not the least, micro plans to be developed for integrated outreach sessions for the referral mechanism to be strengthened, improving access and utilization of the services. So uh, these are the some points which I already mentioned. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you so much. Uh, here, uh, I already mentioned my email address as well. Uh, if someone have any questions, so they can write me down uh, on my email ID. I don't know where. Um, thank you very much, Nazish. Um, yes, and I we do encourage participants on this uh, webinar today to get in touch with our speakers or uh, all the partners uh, organizing this webinar if you have any questions and so on or any opportunities for synergy and partnership. Um, so I want to go on to our next speaker, Radharani. Um, and sort of to kick off uh, her presentation and ask, effective communication strategies are critical to tackling misinformation and generating confidence needed to access essential services. So today, what are the communication strategies that will be needed to restore trust in immunization services and health systems? And uh, could you touch upon your presentation examples of communication strategies that have been effective in doing this? Um, over to you, Radha Rani. Thanks. Thank you, Sheetal. If you can, if Neil, we could have my slide presentation up. Um, while he, while Neil is putting my presentation up, I'd like to just start off. Um, as Sheetal said, I work for BBC Media Action, which has over twenty years uh, experience in health communication. Uh, we use a range of approaches, including mass media, so television and radio, as well as social media, mobile services, community mobilization, and interpersonal communication to improve health outcomes. This experience includes working on vaccine acceptance, including the thorny work around the polio vaccine. We are currently researching, producing, and disseminating COVID-19 content in over 50 languages, reaching approximately 60 million people around the world. And we are also supporting and training media on how to report on COVID-19. What those of us working in health communication know is that well-designed efforts can increase uptake of vaccines. Based on the conversations I'm hearing about a COVID-19 vaccine, I want to share my top five recommendations of how the world should be thinking about communication as it relates to this. So my first, the next slide, please. Um, so the first thing that I want to talk about is really getting ahead of the challenge. The need of the hour is to get in front of this challenge before a vaccine becomes available. We've heard a lot of experts say things like, let's wait for the vaccine to come out. We don't yet have funding for total access, the cold chain storage issues, et cetera, et cetera. Now, all of these challenges are real. They're important and deserve attention with one important caveat. I don't agree with the let's wait notion or that there is some kind of linear approach to this. First comes love, then comes marriage, and then the baby carriage. No, this notion ignores a fundamental truth. People don't just start to think about demand when the product is in front of them. News of the vaccine is everywhere. People are talk already talking about it. They're forming opinions, sharing their views with others. There is much anticipation, expectation, and of course, anxiety. It would be irresponsible to ignore this. While it might be too early to design a demand creation campaign, it may be too late if we wait without doing the prep that's required to produce effective campaigns. So here's what we need to do now. We as a global community actually don't know what the scale of the COVID-19 vaccine resistance problem is going to be. And more research is needed to inform where specifically we need to focus our communication efforts. There is already evidence that vaccine attitude is linked to broader issues of trust in government and health systems. We may need to look at areas where there is this lack of trust or at communities that have historically been resistant to vaccines 
or we may also find new vaccine hesitant communities along the way. Indeed, each country needs its own communication plan for a vaccine rollout, but I believe there are going to be specific communities that will need some focused attention. My next recommendation is, the next slide please, that this science is going to need some art and craft. Scientific presentation of facts or just information is not sufficient to change attitudes and beliefs around vaccines. I'm not saying something new here, but I feel we need to be reminded continuously about the critical difference between information and communication. Behavioral barriers to vaccine uptake are deep rooted in experience, culture, entrenched further by miss and dis and peer pressure. Let's remember anti-vaccine content is compelling and heart driven. Therefore communication solutions aimed at building trust have to be able to capture people's imagination and have a powerful emotional connect. That's why just a scientific presentation of facts is simply not enough. Alongside the science, we need creative strategies and execution. That's the art and craft. We need socio-cultural insights, big ideas, stories and storytellers. We, ne we need new language for frontline health workers and other facilitators and influencers. We need interesting, engaging formats. We need to disrupt. At BBC Media Action, we've been doing this effectively in different parts of the world, and there are valuable lessons from all of that. Just wanted to share a couple of examples here. As part of a UNICEF intervention to mitigate the spread of polio in Somalia, we featured personal stories in our Somali language radio program designed to prepare the ground for the arrival of the mobile polio vaccinators. It allowed people to digest culturally relevant information in advance and made them more amenable to inviting polio vaccinators into their homes. In Nigeria, we recorded our popular Hossa language radio drama in front of a live audience in rural communities and then followed the recordings with discussions with vaccinators and health workers to provide communities with direct answers to questions. Research showed that audiences knew more about how polio is transmitted and prevented and took action following vaccinator visits compared to those who did not listen to the show or participate in the community discussions. You see, the thing is, there is a strong body of evidence of what works in health communication. For example, we know communication needs to connect to people's values, feature trusted voices, and allow space for people to voice their own concerns. We know how to communicate in narrative form, how not to preach. We know to avoid affirming a misperception or amplifying misinformation while trying to correct it. This emphasis on art and craft, narratives and engagement brings me to my next recommendation. The next slide, please. This cannot be one global campaign that is designed in offices in New York, London, or Geneva. Top-down, centrally designed, rapidly produced outputs for mass dissemination simply won't work. Yes, there are universal facts about vaccines and even common insights and reasons why people might be hesitant. But vaccine decisions, as I said earlier, are personal and shaped by cultural and experiential factors. Sure, technical information can be developed centrally, but the actual communication interventions and content making have to be done by and with the people they are trying to serve, rich in cultural insights and psychosocial nuances. Experience shows that hesitancy or things like risk perception exist in pockets or communities. We need to identify these and understand what their fears are. We need to be aware of the prevailing narratives so that these can be addressed robustly and respectfully. This might mean an entirely different communication strategy for a particular religious community or whatever else binds this community, be it language, culture, or geography. What I would caution against is the idea that vaccine communication outputs are produced centrally and merely translated or slightly adapted for rollout elsewhere. And this brings me to my next recommendation. The next slide, please. You see, information is everywhere, right? A local response as opposed to a one size fits all global campaign also allows us to take a holistic understanding of the entire information ecosystem. In real life, people get information from multiple sources throughout their day. If we seek to shift behaviors, we need to reach people in multiple, multiple ways too. 
For example, at BBC Media Action, we would assess the information environment and develop a theory of change that would address multiple audience segments to achieve different outcomes. For example, in one country, it could consist of training media professionals, building capacity of the members of women's economic collectives, as well as creating communication outputs for communities. While in another country, where there is low public trust in health systems or political leaders, find other influential supporters well in advance and use them as spokespersons. Now, obviously, tech pay plays a huge role in shaping the information environment. Infodemic could very well be the wor word of the year. While it's critical to algorithmically shut down the spread of mis, dis, and fake news, I do want to submit quite strongly that it is only a part of the solution. Algorithms can shut down searches, but remember, they can't shut up people in group chats, in private messaging apps, in places of worship, in village squares, and at kitchen tables. And that brings me to the last point, the last recommendation, which is that we need to sustain and adapt. This long haul virus requires long haul communication. In the last eight months, we have all seen the ever changing nature of this pandemic. The world over, contexts have been constantly evolving, which means communication strategies have to be adaptable. We will need tactical approaches to counter whatever the pandemic and the infodemic throw up. As people's direct personal and familial or community experience with the pandemic changes, so will attitudes towards a vaccine. The behavioral insights research I mentioned earlier will need to be mined over and over again. This will not be a one campaign deal. It can't be right before the vaccine is being rolled out. Due to limited supply, it seems clear that the vaccine will be available to different segments of the population at different times. Content for the elderly and immune compromised will be different for, say, for, say, for, from content for youth as their motivators, risk perceptions, influencers, and media habits are bound to be different. This work needs to be sustained and it needs to be carefully orchestrated over time. It cannot be dip in, dip out, you know, a blast on mass media here, an outreach program there. This is a marathon, not a sprint. It would require patience, time, and the right resources, both fiscal and human. We are in it for the long haul. And we can take a look at the last slide, which contains the five recommendations. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Radharani. Uh, and I liked uh, five clear points, uh, like fingers of a hand. Um, so last but not least, I want to turn to Edmund. And in your presentation, Edmund, I'm uh, looking forward to it, is can you reflect on potential risks and opportunities this pandemic and the future of the COVID vaccines in re-engaging communities on immunization, public health services, and increased vaccine uptake? Um, over to you, Edmund. All right, thank you very much. I'm still waiting for my presentation to be shared. So let me start from here. Um, while we're getting that up, Edmund, I wonder if you can sort of share some of your experiences from Ghana um, okay. in this context. So my, my name is Edmund um, Diodi from Ghana. I work with the Ministry of Health and also um, the Executive Director of Divine Mother and Child Foundation, an NGO, which is into um, immunization activity. So today we're going to look at how I look at the opportunities and then the risk involved in the COVID-19 pandemic. We know that um, the COVID-19 is a disaster. And it tells us that uh, we need to be um, so closer and we need um, and we need on. to come together in, can you hear me? 
I can hear you. I just requested those not speaking can keep right. their mic okay. off. Over. Next slide, please. So um, the disaster we find ourselves in, which is COVID-19, um, is telling us that uh, we need to uh, really take critical um, attention um, so that it, uh, this pandemic wouldn't lead to any systemic and cascading risk. And this means that uh, we have to really uh, respect the risks and in, in, in our ability to sustain immunization in face of COVID-19, we also determine the progress we we'll make um, in the 2020, 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda and beyond. The next slide. We all know that um, there is potential risk of COVID-19. The first risk is um, the global rush uh, to find a safe and effective vaccine against COVID-19. And this is really a concern because we've never had any coronavirus um, vaccine. And um, the rush in getting this new vaccine is something that we have to take a, a critical look at. Um, it's really a potential risk for people that we speak with, especially my communities. People are so um, desperate. They are, they are so, um, um, they just want to know what this vaccine will be like. Um, what are the side effects? So the health crisis stress tests our ability to cooperate learn and adapt in the face of deep ascentities and risk, uh, rising risk. Next slide. In fact, uh, with, with the introduction of COVAX, we all know that it's, it's not just been a year. So that, that, the, the concern of really getting this vaccine within this short possible time, is really something that people think that um, if we are able to find that kind of um, vaccine within this short period, and it means that the vaccine is ineffective and unsafe. And that is a concern. That is the kind of myth that people around my community are really thinking about. The next slide. There is also another um, potential risk is the anti-vaccine activities and disinformation campaigns. For instance, um, for the past last week, um, last week we started with the um, yellow fever vaccination campaign in Ghana, in Ghana and um, going around to really vaccinate people, a lot of people are having this kind of hesitancy of getting the yellow fever vaccine because some of them think that it is the COVID-19 vaccine that we are really introducing. And so that's kind of disinformation campaign that people are just really telling them that, oh, the health people have these COVID-19 vaccines and they are really going to uh, vaccinate you. That kind of anti-vaccine activity is really a potential risk for us and we need to really uh, look at it very well to be able to um, uh, really um, uh, have a safe vaccine for, um, I mean, the population. So we also need to look at the community acceptance. It's really a barrier. Um, looking at the community acceptance, it goes with the cultural, religious, and traditional beliefs. Um, in a typical African country, there is kind of traditional beliefs that you do not have to take vaccine. Um, our body is so strong. I mean, as black people, we have black skin and um, we, we can resist any other infections. As at now, so a lot of people in my country, in Ghana, do not still believe that there's, uh, there's COVID-19. And they think that having a COVID-19, when you get in this kind of hard uh, alcohol, it will be able to clear the COVID-19 from your system. So, these are, so they still don't even believe in COVID-19 at the moment. And that is really a major challenge and a risk for us to get uh, 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 vaccines for COVID-19. There's also another challenge looking at where we are coming from. Uh, storage of vaccine, delivering of vaccine is a major challenge. So um, the expected volume of vaccine needed is huge and the system may not be equipped in all parts of the country to safely store vaccines and administer a large number of doses over a short period of time. So we still have that kind of thing. We are going to introduce new vaccines into the system. Do we have that capacity uh, I mean, to really store these vaccines so that it will be really effective for um, the population. The next slide. But then, what are the opportunities that we have? And what are some of the things that we can do to improve or uh, to get a kind of um, trust from the people? Uh, in fact, if you look at Ghana, um, the expanded program of immunization has helped reduce infant mortality. 
since 2003, there has never been any death caused by first, uh, measles. While in 2011, Ghana was certified as having attained elimination status for maternal and neonatal and neonatal titanus. This has been possible with effort by all stakeholders through community engagement and using the community structures. So this is something that we can leverage on. This is something that we can learn from to really look at what we can do to get that kind of trust um, with the introduction of COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide. So these are some of the recommendations or the actions that I think um, should be implemented at all levels to really have that kind of trust, to really engage communities, to ensure that we have COVID-19 vaccines are, uh, are so safe that people really um, have it uh, and then get that kind of vaccination around the whole world. So the first one is community engagement, engage public community about vaccine benefit, risks and supply. In fact, in Ghana, this is one strategy that is really helping us to reduce maternal mortality, especially with the introduction of vaccines. Growing up as a little boy from my own village, I saw so many people having been paralyzed due because of poliomyelitis, a lot of people getting uh, measles. But with the introduction of vaccines, we've been able to eliminate uh, all these, I mean, uh, diseases from our, our system. And we were able to do that through community engagement and public engagement. So we have to also include uh, public and then the communities, especially with the introduction of COVID-19 vaccines. And then also, we have to communicate in meaningful and relevant and personal terms, crowding out misinformation. So there's a lot of misinformation around. There's a lot of anti-vaccine uh, campaigns. There's a lot of hesitancy. What can we do? We have to communicate the information in a relevant and then a personal terms to crowd out misinformation. And we have to do that with what? With a public stakeholder engagement. So it still boils down to what? Having community engagement. And in community engagement, we have to communicate effectively to really um, get a formative research and message development, a real message development, like the community, how we can communicate to people. And this is really important to have that trust in immunization. The next slide. There's another thing we need to do. We have to allocate adequate funds for COVID-19 vaccine. All government across the whole world should commit a portion of their budget to vaccine research, especially for COVID-19. This is a new thing that we are going to have. So we need to allocate more funds for that. We have to integrate COVID-19 activities into our routine service, health services across our various countries. And then also we have to engage civil society and other partners. Civil, civil societies and other partners will be able to support government in social mobilization, effective for medication to address vaccine hesitancy. And then also, as a typical um, community health nurse in Ghana, community health nurses like myself and all other colleagues around the whole country in Ghana is a major contributing factor for effective immunization campaigns in Ghana. Community health nurses across the whole country lives in the community, provide immunization services for these communities. So as a form of strategy, all other countries should learn by strengthening the capacity of community health nurses. Community health nurses like myself are really important to ensure that we address all these issues, especially with the hesitancy issues. We live with the community. The community sees us as part of them. So whenever we speak with them, they will be able to listen to us. And then also in our community health structure, we have the community volunteers. We have the community health committees. The community health committees are people that are selected from the community, like the traditional leaders, um, like the uh, religious leaders, and then other people, respected people from the community. So when they form, when they come together as a committee, they will really uh, try to disseminate proper information to the community members. And this will address um, hesitancy issues in terms of immunization of vaccine in their communities. The next aspect with the fear of the unknown that the vaccine that is coming wouldn't be safe. There's the need to make vaccination available in safe, familiar and convenient places. 
and making vaccines widely available and accessible will entail public health authorities preparing to meet communities. The fear of the African person, the fear of the people in Ghana is that those in the white people will try to have their, a different vaccine and um, bringing an inferior vaccine to the African community. So there is a need to let people know that this vaccine that is going to be provided is available and is safe and is accessible to everybody. So no matter where you are, you, there, is, there should be that kind of um, accessible vaccines for everybody. And that will really help us to have that kind of trust for immunization in the, uh, in the, years, to, uh, in the years coming. Thank you. Um, thank you. Edwin. I think that is the, next, the last slide, right? Thank you so much, Edwin. Um, so I want to thank all our speakers today um, for sharing this very insightful information with us. We'll be taking questions from the audience now, and it's good to see the chat has been active as well as sharing links and contacts. Uh, so it's great to have this dialogue going on. I want to kick off with a few questions I'm seeing in the chat. Please do keep them coming. Um, the first one is um, from Claire. It's directed to Rena. Um, um, how can we get youth more involved? Um, as well as how can we integrate services such as WASH and routine immunizations, uh, immunization? prior to the uh, COVID vaccine rollout. Um, so in touching on youth engagement, uh, Rina, I wonder if you can also talk to us about uh, uh, where youth and children lie within the community engagement strategy. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you, uh, Shetu. Um, I, would, I would like to address first how, how we can involve children uh, in, in, in uh, basically giving information to the community uh, as well as uh, because in polio program we have involved children greatly uh, by uh, fully involvement of education department uh, so we actually engaged teachers so that uh, a, a polio class can be conducted inside the school premises with the various uh, school grades children um, so, so children, uh, before we engage the children, we oriented uh, the school teachers on what are those technical things, technical information that they need to know, and what are those doable um, polio class in the polio class that a teacher can do. So these, uh, there was a package developed where we, uh, in how, how we can engage the school teacher. Uh, so if we, I think, I think, uh, Claire wants to know, so maybe I can share some of those uh, those packaged uh, materials that we have uh, through email, uh, and also we have formed. Uh, they are called brand band ambassador of, uh, among children for polio, and they were given specially uh, special batches and special uh, aprons that they wear it during the polio campaign, as well as immunization campaign also. So they were promoting uh, immunization uh, messages um, by conducting rallies, by conducting fun classes. So there is a designed fun classes, which is conducted in government school uh, in, in, in areas where we are working. And those fun classes are very much uh, uh, story and uh, game oriented, which basically handles hand washing, the importance of hand washing and how a virus is transmitted. So which is a very interesting game. Uh, I won't be able to tell you here, but I can share those games through email. So that's how we, and, and these engagement of children has been very, very fruitful in terms of, uh, uh, you know, creating enabling environment as well, because on the day of campaign, these children come out with whistles and colorful aprons. That's, that gives a very festive environment. Um, so that's that's on the part of children environment uh, involvement. Um, uh, in terms of wash activity, uh, how can we have safe uh, 
hand wash practices, uh, even when the COVID vaccine comes out at the session site. Now here, what we have worked is, uh, we, we have strategized is uh, with the help of uh, village head, because he has uh, the power, number one. Number two, he also has funds also to, to uh, allocate, ensuring that the soap, water, and area also is given particularly for uh, hand washing practices, uh, because that is something that he or she is responsible to uh, ensure that uh, these uh, uh, material is available at the session site before uh, you uh, actually sanitize the area. So these things can be possible. And we had a very good interaction with our uh, uh, field uh, volunteers, and they have already uh, communicated with our village head. And right now, actually, during whenever there is sessions are conducted, um, village head do ensure that the sessions are sanitized and uh, soap, water, and uh, bucket is made available for health worker as well as for mothers. Thank you. Over and out. Thank you very much, Rina. Um, the insights appreciated. I, my next question, I wonder if I can ask um, Joseph and Radharani, um, what are the stresses in reaching uh, certain categories of people such as pregnant women? Um, of course, due to situations like lockdowns, restricted mobility, and of course, the fear of contracting COVID-19. Um, and what, op what opportunities, uh, particularly in rural areas uh, like Somalia, um, and also where certain NGOs are now facing, um, you know, who work in these rural areas that are remote and are now going to make close or have limited activities in the field uh, due to funding. So how can civil society and its partners uh, address this situation? Uh, over to you, Joseph and Radharani, over. Yeah, thank you, Shinto. Um, <clears throat> I would start with the first uh, question around uh, how the stress is in reaching uh, pregnant women due to restricted uh, mobility. Um, sharing some few experiences we had at the, at the peak of the pandemic in Somalia, there, there were really, really um, movement restrictions put in place by the government and um, we had to navigate at some point to engage with the government to allow for movement of uh, uh, medical supplies and commodities. And, uh, but uh, out planned outreaches that would, would always be used to reach out to communities uh, in hard to reach communities were stopped. And what we had to do was to um, sort of put in place, uh, reach out to the community health committees that we have set up within these communities in the remote areas to engage closely with them through WhatsApp group messages where applicable regular calls to them. And what we had to do was to um, have um, peer groups, more like um, women groups, pregnant women who are within the same um, gestational age group were put in groups and um, were remotely sort of engaged. Nothing much was done in terms of providing medical support directly, but we had to just keep them together. And with the um, easing of um, movement restrictions, we intensified uh, and accelerated the uh, outreach services. And what we had to do was to provide a complete package uh, not just um, antenatal care, for example, integrated with it. It was integrated with immunization services and all of the um, package of services that we that could be provided in an outreach setting. So that's how we began to, you know, sort of bridge that gap that um, had been at the peak of COVID because of the restricted uh, mobility. One other thing we did at that time was. Uh, maintained, um, we have this uh, men, men support groups, we call them men, uh, father to father support groups, where we build their capacity and support them to hold meetings and discussions. Because in Somalia, we know that um, um, men are essentially, they have the stronger say in terms of decision making, 
within the household. So with engagement, then it's easier for the woman to either take the child for immunization or to even go by herself for antenatal services and uh, all that. So we kept them engaged, the men engaged, and it was easier when the outreaches began, the accelerated outreaches began, it was easier for a higher turnout that we expected. We began to see over the past couple of um, one, two months that we started that. Yeah, moving on to the <clears throat> other question that touched around um, uh, how we can uh, engage uh, the CS CSOs, what the CSOs can do with respect to uh, exit of NGOs because uh, uh, as around uh, immunization in hard to reach areas. One of the things um, I, I really see is um, there should be some stronger community structures being built. At the moment, what happens in some parts of Somalia is, um, you know, funding comes, the project comes, it's implemented, and there is no proper exit strategy. So one first thing we should understand as um, NGO partners is at some point, the community and the government will need to take over provision of services. So these structures need to be built and sustained. And um, that is one key thing that we should begin to look at. Then also, um, there should be stronger CSO engagement with the government. Um, what, what we've no noticed over the past couple of years is um, the government has maintained in Somalia, the government has maintained the same rhetoric of, oh, there is no funding. Uh, you all know that we don't have funding, but the situation now is not the same 10 years ago. So there should be some increasing uh, accountability and um, responsibility that the government should begin to take on. And that is one of the things as Save the Children we are pushing for. And um, we've seen that in some of our projects where we insist that the government needs to contribute some percentage to funding some of the projects, even though in a significant percent will be donor funded. The government should begin to get more involved. And um, we've seen some results, though the results are sort of mixed. Uh, the government in the last minute saying, no, they cannot. There is no funding and all of that. But we need to, on all fronts, push and see how our CSOs get the government more involved and more accountable so that um, there should be increasing um, resource uh, allocation for health in, in Somalia. That way, they should be, they would be able to begin to take uh, ownership of uh, the health systems in Somalia. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much, Joseph. Um, Radharani, um, over to you. And also, uh, Radharani, in your answer, uh, you've shared something very interesting in the chat about how we focused a lot of our global funding, multilateral funding on um, the R&D and access issues, um, allocation and strategy of COVID vaccines. But what about COVID-19 communication response, uh, present and future when the vaccines are rolled out? And uh, touching on last mile engagement. Um, so over to you, Radharani. Thank you. Um, thanks, thanks, Sheetal. Uh, I think that there are certain available platforms in most countries. So for example, local radio stations, which we have used extensively in our work in Africa and some of the countries in Asia, community radio stations. I also think that uh, frontline health workers should be kind of retooled uh, to counsel people on um, you know, uh, COVID-19 vaccine when the time comes. So, and the prep needs to start now, as I said in my presentation. In terms of youth and uh, uh, I think there is a role that young people, young influencers can definitely play. I'm currently working with our teams in Afghanistan and Somalia on COVID-19 um, communication. And in both countries, we are actually focusing quite a lot on youth. So for example, in, uh, Afghan in Somalia, we are using radio to speak to you know, urban poor, internally displaced people. But we are also using, going to be using social media for 
urban youth because you know young people in Somalia are a lot on Facebook. Um, similarly, in Afghanistan, we have you know a dual pronged strategy. We are doing some work using mass media for urban poor and rural poor, but we are also doing a very bespoke intervention for uh, the nomads, uh, people who are traveling from place to place. And uh, interestingly, interestingly enough, uh, all these no, uh, nomads, they have you know, access to mobile phones, but they have access to basic phones more than smartphones. And therefore we are using IVR and local community radio stations to do what at BBC Media Action we call fast fiction, which means use drama, principles of drama, storytelling, characterization, but you know, do bite-sized pieces of drama so that they can be, uh, you know, broadcast, sit in other programs, broadcast on their own, sit, sit within other programs, as well as be disseminated through IVR technology on mobile phones. So, you know, it is really about behavioral insights, two things actually. One is to look at behavioral insights and mine them over and over again. So this time that we have now before the vaccine comes out really should be put to good use to learn more and more about um, you know, the graph of uh, hesitancy, trust issues, etc. As well as we to do some landscaping on formats, because given, given the lack of lockdown conditions, you know, and the nature of the, of the virus, um, it's good to know what's available to us and to innovate within those frameworks and formats. So research and landscaping, I think, are key points, key activities for now. And the point that I'm making again is even to learn more about both media and platform landscapes and behavioral insights research, we need resourcing because we can't, we, we can get insights out We've muted Radha Rani. Yeah, so I was just saying that this time we have before the vaccine really hits the ground should be really put to use, good use, because we need to learn. We need to learn more about how, you know, the, the about behavioral insights as well as landscaping to know what kind of platforms, what kind of, you know, touch points are available for us not only for mass media dissemination, but this last mile engagement. And we need to innovate. We need to manage constraints. I think managing constraints is going to become a real big uh, mechanism because there are so many constraints that we have to work with in the current environment, you know, mobility constraints uh, and things like that. So, and, and I have always believed that creativity is also about managing constraints. How do you find solutions? So that's the mindset with which I think, uh, you know, the SBCC community or people like us have to jump into the entire communication thing around COVID-19, vaccine hesitancy, promoting, creating demand creation. Over. Um, thank you so much, Radharani. Um, I think there'll be a lot of uh, ask for where to allocate, where to access these resources uh, once our reports you've touched. Uh, Edmund, um, do you think I can ask you uh, to say a last word about youth engagement, which for years we've known in, um, I mean, I would say globally, youth is sort of, you know, uh, one of the cornerstones we've often forgotten. So what are your thoughts, uh, Edmund? on youth engagement, particularly in this pandemic uh, and, and post-pandemic, over? Um, I think there's a huge role young people can play. And given the fact that a lot of young people have a smartphone in their hands, I mean, I was looking at data in India, by 2025, there are going to be 900 million plus smartphones. And, you know, uh, there's been a very interesting research done across 21 countries by Kantar, which is part of the WPP group, and it is a consumer research piece uh, on COVID-19 implications. And they have found um, that uh, people are spending up to three hours and 41 minutes, young people are spending up to three hours and 41 minutes on their phones. And this is not just true of India, it would be more in some other countries. So I think that it's very, very critical and it's going to be highly strategic to find influences amongst youth. And I think, you know, there's a lot of focus on storytelling 
um, you know, in the in the in the arena of communications today. And I think we must use young people to tell stories, their own stories, sharing of stories. And uh, uh, while we do that, I think there are there are there are two ways or two strategies to be used with young people. One is actually to talk about looking ahead and you know working around vaccine hesitancy and trust issues, but very closely allied to that would be about getting young, young people on side and uh, against the spread of mis and dis uh, and fake news. And in fact, as part of our COVID response, COVID-19 response, um, in about seven countries across Asia, right in the beginning, towards the beginning of the pandemic, we did extensive work on uh, misinformation and you know how not to fall prey to the infodemic. So I think you know it's vaccine hesitancy or promoting or creating demand for the C19 vaccine is not just about the vaccine. It is about the total life that people's people are le uh, leading now, given all the challenges that we all are facing. And there are lots of it's like a spider's web. There are lots of connections, you know, the vaccine to the pandemic graphs and to, you know, uh, people, fe people feeling limited to the infodemic, all of that. So one really needs to unpack and look at key thematic focus areas. One honestly needs a really, really smart theory of change. But as I said earlier, bespoke theories of change for different parts of the world, because the contexts are going to be very, very different. Thank you so much, Radha Rani. Um, I wonder, Edmund, uh, in your context in Ghana, um, what do you think some of the resources we can tap into uh, or some of the mechanisms we can tap into to address and to focus on youth in particularly with COVID? Over. We need uh, more youth um, to be champions, especially for um, immunization. Um, if you look at our population as young people, um, we represent about 40% of the uh, world total population. It means that we are a revolution. We are the future. And as the future of, of this world, we need to be involved. We need to be part of the decision making, or we need to be part of the, um, of whatever uh, that is. I mean, we have to be involved in every decision that we make uh, that is made for us. Uh, more at times, people, uh, a lot of people, go to the decision table and take decision for the youth. And when they come back, we really want to resist because we are not part of the decision making. So as youth and as, as, as a Ghanaian, um, we have been, been able to use more youth now. For instance, I, I'm a nurse and, 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 and I'm also a nurse manager in a way. So when there's any kind of decision making, I'm part of it and I'll be able to relay the same information to my people. Who are um, who are trying to be resistant, and this is what we have to be doing. We have to engage more youth uh, to be champions. In fact, for the past uh, few months, we've been able to be part of the um, Gavi CSO um, community champions. I mean, my colleagues, and we're learning a lot of things to be able to uh, impact our community, especially the youth population in our communities. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Edmund. Um, and thank you to all the speakers today uh, for taking the time to share your insight, Rina, Joseph, Nazish, um, Radharani and Edmund. I also want to thank the organizers and partners, um, Action Global Health Advocacy Partnership, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance Results, Save the Children, and of course, Gavi CSO constituency. Um, it seems that, you know, it's sort of an unprecedented, we've never known this in the recent times. And although in the past certain pandemics would have been addressed with science, um, R&D and uh, public health, it seems right now uh, community actors that also include youth and neglected groups and their voices need to be heard. But also we need to think more about how, um, how we can tap into the media and social media which are playing such a big role prior to the vaccine or with regards to the to the covid virus is what what can we do globally in that effort um we also need more attention from big vaccine multilaterals uh, there's been limited funding that has been given uh in regards to the demand um so here at Gavi CSO, we're looking forward to hearing from you um, 
and also I'm sure our speakers are looking forward to exchanges yeah, after yeah, this. So to please get in touch with us all um, and how we can better share solutions. Um, and also once the vaccine rolls out, how we can better ensure a representation. Uh, we have been playing a big role along with several of our civil society colleagues and our multilateral partners and national government to ensure civil society representation in the ACTA accelerator. There's a number of calls that are out for civil society representation. So please do get in touch. Um, and we look forward to hearing you from you soon. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, too.